Welcome, everybody, to the Spring Fever Garden Forums. This is where we connect you, the gardener, to the researchers at North Dakota State University. And my name is Tom Kolb. I'm an extension horticulturist in the Department of Plant Sciences. So let's get started. Let's talk about potatoes. And potatoes, one of the biggest crops in North Dakota, both in the garden and on the farm. And here to talk about potatoes is Dr. Andy Robinson. Andy is an associate professor and the extension potato agronomist for both North Dakota State University and the University of Minnesota. Andy develops science-based solutions to address problems in potato production, enabling producers to both increase economic and environmental sustainable sustainability through improved crop production management. And Andy's passion is potatoes. So you're the, you're, you're the best person to teach us about potatoes. So Andy, welcome to the forums. Thank you. Thanks, Tom, for the opportunity to be here. So I'm going to talk about growing tasty taters in your garden. Potatoes are one of my favorite things, as Tom mentioned. So why potatoes? Well, it's the number one consumed vegetable in, in the United States. It has a high nutritional value and low cost. Uh, some research that came out of Washington a few years back showed potato had one of the lowest costs to buy and one of the highest nutrient values. The only crop above it was dry beans. And the other big reason why we have potatoes is because they have a very high production. You typically are going to get somewhere between seven to 9% more production per area than a grain crop like wheat or corn or something like that. And the big reason is because potatoes have a lot of water, but it's all food and it's good for you. And what I always say, you know, potatoes themselves are very healthy. It's just all the other things that you put on them that make them not so healthy. So let's talk a little bit about potato varieties. There's a lot of different shades and colors of potatoes they come in. Uh, commonly, of course, here are red potatoes. There's also yellows, which are gaining more popularity. And then you have some russets, whites, purples, finger lanes, et cetera. They vary in size, shape, form, and they're also vary in their length of growing season. There's some that are short of 70 days, some that'll take 150 days or longer to grow. And so really selecting the right variety that suits your needs and your desires is important to do. So just talking about varieties a little bit, let's focus on reds. Reds are the most common fresh potato in the Midwest of the United States. They tend to have more of a waxy texture when you eat them. And so they're suitable for a lot of culinary uses in homes. Most of them have a white flesh, but there are some varieties that will have a yellow flesh. Some common varieties that are grown are probably red Norland is the most commonly grown. Red Pontiac is also grown, has a very good flavor. And red Lasota is one that's grown a little bit more in hotter climates, uh, but we do have some here too. If we look at yellow skin potatoes, yellows have been increasing in popularity for a number of years. And the number of yellow potatoes grown when we look at it at a national, it continues to increase. And so there's certainly a consumer demand and desire to eat yellow potatoes. Yellow potatoes are very common in Europe and other countries. So there's a lot of good varieties out there, good genetics out there that we can actually get and use and grow in our gardens. And they're very similar to the red potatoes. They tend to have more of a waxy texture. Some of them can be more starchy but they can be used for a lot of things. In Europe, they use them even for chipping and frying. And uh, some do have a whiter flesh, some have a yellow flesh, even a dark yellow flesh. And that yellow flesh is actually a result of the carotenoids that are in there. And so some people say it gives it more of a buttery flavor. So Yukon Gold is probably one of the most commonly known ones that we have, but when you look in catalogs, you can find things like German Butterball, Satina, other varieties. And then we go to the whites and russets. I group these together because typically our white and russet potatoes are the ones that have a higher starch content. They're utilized for making French fries and potato chips. If you go to the East Coast, white skin potatoes, like this picture with lots of tubers on it, is the most common fresh potato you'll buy there. Russet Burbank is the most common russet variety. Russets typically are the most oblong potato <clears throat> and they're used for making French fries, but you go out west, that's the most common potato out west that people are gonna have in their homes and buy at grocery stores as a russet potato. They have very good dormancy, they store for a long time, and they tend to have more of that mealy texture to them when you eat them. So the last one we'll mention here are the potatoes, the pinto potatoes and the fingerlings. These are a little bit more of the specialties. And you know they come in all different kinds of sizes and shapes and splashes of colors. 
Uh, they're typically similar to the reds and yellows. They tend to have more of a waxy texture to them and, and smooth flavor that you're going to get. And they can be a little bit more challenging to grow, sometimes maybe not as much production as some of the other varieties, but they're a lot of fun to grow, I think, and, um, you know, fun to try out. So here's just some examples. I looked at some seed catalogs and you can order potato seeds in a lot of places, but, you know, just looking at these seed catalogs, a couple of screen screenshots, you can see they've got reds, yellows, purples, green greens, pintos, et cetera. They've got all kinds of types of potatoes uh, that they would sell you. And so there's a lot of options out there. So let's talk a little bit about growing potatoes. So some tips on seed. We really recommend buying certified seed. Uh, don't save your seed from the previous year and regrow it. There's a variety of reasons why. The main reason though is because the pathogen buildup, you can get virus that's transmitted through aphids or diseases that could compromise the yield and production of that potato. And especially when you have virus, it's just gonna continue to spread year after year after year. And that slowly reduces your yield and your quality of your tubers. Usually, you know, we're gonna to recommend to plant your potatoes when those eyes just start to peep. You'll just start to see that it's a little bit of growth out of those eyes. If you cut the seed, that will actually help break the dormancy. It will actually cause the biochemical systems to kick into place where they will start to say, hey, I need to start growing. And so when you do plant your seed potatoes into the soil, you really wanna to try to match the temperature of your tuber with the soil. And so an easy way to do that is to take a thermometer, such as if you have a meat thermometer that will go down low enough to maybe like 40, 50 degrees, you just poke it inside the tuber, leave it in there for a couple of minutes, see what the temperature is. And you can actually use that same thermometer and put it in the soil uh, at the location in the soil where you're gonna plant the tuber. You wanna be really within about 10 degrees matching from tuber to soil temperature. Cause what that'll do, if that tuber is too cold, it'll cause condensation around it, which could lead to bacterial diseases. And so that's important to match the temperature. And then if it's too hot to cold, it can stress it. So anyways, important is to keep good moisture. You don't want wet sopping soil where you can squeeze it and you have water dripping out of it, but you also don't want soil that's so dry that you can't even like make a fall out of it. So maintaining good soil moisture through the growing season is going to be important. So some tips on planting. Uh, a common recommendation is to plant two weeks prior to the last frost because it will take those tubers about two to three weeks for the sprouts to grow. And you want that soil temperature between about 45 and 70 degrees. There's a figure here I show you on the right. It just shows how fast those sprouts grow. And so they will grow at 45 degrees, but they do very slowly. The sprouts are going to grow the fastest when that soil temperature is at about 70 degrees. And that's kind of the range. But yeah, if you can get your soil between 55 to 70 degrees, you can have fairly rapid emergence of your potatoes as long as those eyes are, you know, the dormancy is broke, those eyes are starting to peep. Some things people use, I might use tunnels or mulches to help increase the soil, the temperature, or, you know, help out, you know, try to warm things up quicker if they want um, to get those out of the ground faster. Mulches can also help with controlling weeds and maintaining moisture in those hills. So those are things that can be done. So preparing the soil with fertility is very important. Uh, potatoes do use a lot of nutrition. They have really a poor rooting system. So that's why they need to stay moist and that's why they need good fertilizer because um, that poor root system is not very efficient at taking those up. So most commonly, you know, you wanna, if you're planting rows to rows, like in this picture, you, know, you gotta decide how far apart you're going to do it. And then typically you're gonna plant your seed pieces about six inches deep, about the length of a dollar bill. And then reshaping the hills is important because that will prevent tubers from getting green from sunlight. It helps maintain the moisture in the hill. And um, it's a common practice that we use right after planting. Just depends on how you plant. If you plant into big beds, you may not have to reshape your hills, but if you have smaller hills when you plant, um, you can put more dirt on them and increase the size and the width. So by planting deeper, you will act, you'll have more consistent moisture at that depth versus planting about two or three inches on a hill, on a ridge hill, you're gonna to tend to dry that out a little bit more. Uh, planting whole seed is actually good because it reduces the potential for bacteria and other disease entry. If you do cut your seed, what you should do is either plant it immediately and then it will heal in the soil or you can superize it, basically let that cut heal. It takes about seven to 10 days 
and you want to maintain about 90 to 95% relative humidity. And a good way to do that is if you have like an area, you can just take like a burlap bag and wet it and just lay it on the floor next to it. Take a few of those. It'll help keep the moisture up and about 50 to 55 degrees. is kind of what you look for when you're trying to put a good healing on that, on that seed piece. If it's too dry, it just basically just dries up on the edge and it's easily broken, which makes an entry point for diseases. So as far as spacing goes to within the rows, just kind of a general principle, the wider or the more distance between tubers is going to mean, mean more room for those plants to grow, which means those tubers will get bigger. The closer together you plant, then the more competition you have and the smaller the tubers will be. Typically, um, the amount of tubers per stem is genetically controlled. And so if you know you have a variety that sets a lot of tubers, and you want them to grow a little bit, grow a little bigger, you can just space your seed out a little bit more. Or if you want them to have smaller tubers, maybe more of the bite-sized tubers, then just plant them closer together. So as far as nutrition goes, potatoes, like I said, use a lot of fertilizer, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are very much needed in potatoes. So if you can find something that's like a 10, 10, 10, or 10, 20, 20, or a 10, 15, 10, or something along those lines, you're gonna put about three to four pounds of that fertilizer per every 30, it's three by 30 rows, three by 30 feet of row space. So that's about 90 square feet. That's about the amount that you would use. If you're going to use uh, fertilizers, uh, make sure they don't have herbicides on them um, or using mulches from your grass if your, you know, your yard has been sprayed with say a herbicide to control weeds. Uh, don't use those mulches we've I've seen and had issues with that before um, typically you know you're going to fertilize uh, at planting right before planting or at the, when you're going to reshape your hills and so you want most of your fertilizer up front and I'll show you why here so you can see this figure here don't really pay attention to the numbers so much but you can just kind of see in that first 30 to 60 days, that's when the plants take up most of that nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And so that's why they need it up front, because they're going to take that up early on to get that plant growing, to get those tubers start to grow, and then, they're, then their needs lessen as the season goes on. So that's why we typically put most of our fertility up front. So when growing the potatoes, we want to, like I said, maintain most moist soils, and we want to manage the pests, fertilize them. And then a couple of big things too is if late blight, and I'll show you some pictures of what late blight looks like, if you su suspect that we want to send samples to the laboratory at NDSU, because it's a community, community disease and it will spread. I mean, tomatoes will actually usually show up first, but potatoes are very susceptible as well as peppers and eggplants. Any solanaceae crops can be susceptible to late blight. And it's a very devastating disease. It can wipe out your crop in just a matter of days. And uh, it'll even get into the tubers and cause the tubers to rot. If you're going to store potatoes, remove the vines about two to three weeks before harvesting, and that'll allow the skins on those tubers to set. We call it skin set, but just so the skins will harden so they don't get ripped or torn at harvest, because if they get ripped or torn, you're going to lose moisture and you're going to have a disease entry point. So this is late blight. Late blight is what caused the Irish potato famine. Uh, this fungus will get on the plants. And you can see on the far right picture, that's kind of the early stages, get kind of those black watery marks. As it develops, you get a little bit of like a light green halo around it and it can get in the tubers. And so it's a really bad disease and we wanna really try to prevent that one as much as possible. Early blight is another problem. It's often called target spot in other countries because it kind of has a target looking um, spot on that leaf. This is endemic, you're gonna see it every year. Uh, plants that are stressed for nitrogen are gonna be more likely to have this and especially on the lower leaves. So one of the keys is maintaining good fertility will help prevent this disease. So you don't want to overwater. Uh, this is a picture from some of our plots. One year we had a bunch of rainfall, but this is bad because it can lead to a variety of different problems. The lenticels, the little air spots on the tubers, will they exchange air? Those can enlarge. That can allow entry of bacterial soft rot. Uh, you can get stem rot from overwatering or even black heart of the tubers, which is just a blackening on the inside of the tuber because it doesn't have enough oxygen. So this is what lenticel enlargement looks like. You can kind of see the scars. And as those tubers sit, you see a little these little halos around the lenticels is actually um, a disease they're growing. You can see here on the far right, it's spreading more. And soft bacterial soft rot is a common thing that we see. But sometimes you'll have these lenticels will pop. They look just fine, but as tubers stay in storage longer, uh, it will develop. 
Uh, the soft rot of the tubers, we've probably all seen this on a year when you get a lot of rain or you accidentally overwater it or something happens, it, the tubers completely break down and they stink. And that's just really a result of too much water and the tuber can't breathe. And this is the black heart I mentioned. Uh, sometimes you get a blackening of the interior of the tuber. It's just because the tuber can't get enough air. It doesn't go all the way to soft rot, but it's a uh, physiological disorder, we call it, because those cells basically die there. And um, it can happen anytime during the growing season or when you're storing the tubers, if they don't get enough oxygen, they're a living organism and they need to breathe too. If you underwater, uh, there's always problems with this too. You reduce your growth, you stress the plants, you can cause the tubers to get ugly. Uh, growth cracks, common scab are co common things that happen from stress, stress events in potatoes. So growth cracks like this can be caused from a lot of things. Diseases can cause them, herbicide injury can cause them, but even just stressful growing conditions can cause tubers to crack. And all it is, is just those tubers are growing so fast. Those cells are, are just growing so fast that when they get disrupted and they stop growing, well, all of a sudden you kind of get this line of this area where, you know, it didn't continue to grow. And so something like this, a deeper crack like this probably happened early on in the growing season because as that tuber continued to grow, that crack got deeper and deeper. Common scab is something I see a lot of pictures from, from home gardeners and common scab can take a lot of forms. And so this disease is common in almost all soils. It varies a lot from year to year. And so it can be very subtle like these pictures show, or it can be a lot more pronounced. And so on these pictures, you can see it actually can look almost like a boil or we can have what's called pitted scab on the right. So we can go into the tuber. And so scab's pretty ugly, nobody likes to see it. Uh, but the good thing about it is you can just cut it off if you don't like the way it looks and the rest of the tuber is just fine. And even with most potato issues and diseases, you know, they're not gonna harm you. You can eat the tubers, you can just cut it off if you don't like it. So some comments on common scab, some things you can do to help prevent common scab is you wanna maintain good soil moisture, especially during that early tuber bulking. And so tubers will start setting usually around about 40 to 45 days after planting. And so maintaining good soil moisture at that point on is really important. Avoiding manures. Manures have been shown when you add manure to fields uh, or growing areas of potatoes, it can increase the chances of scab. If you're trying to adjust your pH by increasing it, lime has also been shown to increase scab. Soil rotation is very important. Don't plant potatoes in the same spot in your garden every year. Try to do about a three to four year rotation and that's gonna help. And then also choosing varieties that tend to have uh, scab resistance. And so they'll, there's a lot of varieties that may say they have resistance to scab and you might find a lot of scab sometimes in your potatoes, but it, it's based on where those potatoes were bred at and tested at. So maybe in that area, they were res resistant to scab, but you have a different you know, species of scab maybe in your soil sometimes. So some suggestions here. Um, to improve potato production. Again, use a, a rotation three to four years. Use cer certified seed. Don't use seed from the grocery store because they put sprout inhibitors on it. Don't save your seed because you're gonna just basically be causing a domino effect of problems. Um, so just not using manure or compost because that can increase scab. Use adequate fertilizer and keep your soils moist. As far as eating potatoes, like I said, just cut off the undesirable parts. And we don't you know, want to eat green potatoes because they heck can have solanin in them, which could get you maybe a tummy ache or make you not feel good. So if you want to know more about potatoes, there's a great website, potatogoodness.com. There's a lot of fun recipes on there. There's more information on potatoes, on the nutritional value of them. This is put on by Potatoes USA, which is a national organization that is here to promote potatoes. They actually have a chef they hire that comes up with fun dishes on how to cook and prepare potatoes. So that's my 20 minutes and I hope you enjoy growing potatoes this year and I'm happy to uh, help answer any questions that anybody might have. Okay, thanks Andy, great. Because we've got some questions already coming in. Um, Excellent. Here we go. Do you have any tips about uh, growing them in pots or bags? I don't what kind of tips, I guess, could you be a little bit more? The clear? bigger the pot, the better. Okay. Yeah, exactly. How about that. Yeah. yeah. Bigger the pot, the better would be good. Yep. Uh, the about, other thing would be a too, is if you're on a pot, don't let it get too hot. Potatoes are a cool season crop. So don't just let them sit on like a South porch. That may not be good. 
And I wonder how economic it is to grow potatoes in a pot compared to other vegetables. Uh, would you grow them in a five gallon bucket? A lot of container yeah, you, gardens here. You could, if you wanted to just make sure you got, I'd say, make sure you got some good holes and drainage in there. So you don't overwater them and get them too wet. So got some advice tried to... on controlling potato beetles, Andy. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. So rotation is going to help you because they're going to overwinter and they're going to crawl out the next year to try to find potatoes, but it probably won't help you, I guess, a lot in the garden. I think there might be, I can't, I've talked to my entomologist friends. That I think there's one product that can be used. Like you can pick up at Home Depot that might help control them. Um, yeah. Spinosad. Vacuum. Yeah. Spinosad. I've seen, I've seen them make vacuums, taking vacuums out, like big vacuums to suck them up. I mean, that's an option. Um, but yeah, not beetles are a tough one. So, yeah, they've developed uh, resistance to seven. Looks like the carbril and oh yeah, they're, they're the poster child for resistance. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. There's a lot of questions, like you said. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever thought about like some people plant their potatoes on top of the soil and then they cover it with hay or mulch? What do you think about that? Um, I don't know. I've never done that before. So. You know, I think you want to maintain good moisture if you do that, but I don't know. Okay. Uh, does flower color relate to skin color? Not always. Nope. So I've seen purple flowers that are russet potatoes, white flowers that are russet potatoes. So it's often close, but not always. I've seen purple flowers that are white chipping potatoes. So, you know, why do the potatoes sometimes grow berries? So that's this natural way of reproducing. So when that pollen in the flower, you know, you get the pollen in the, in the flower, basically it makes a, a berry, which is full of seeds. So you could actually take that berry and harvest out 200 seeds. The problem is we don't use potato seeds because potatoes are what we call a tetraploid. So you've got four sets of chromosomes. So when those mix, you get, you never know what you're gonna get with that seed, but you can take it and grow it and see what you get for fun. That's what a plant breeder would do, huh? Exactly. That's exactly what plant breeders do. Yeah. Uh, are they edible? Are those berries edible? I don't um, probably wouldn't try those because yeah. pretty much everything on the potato plant is going to have the glycoalkaloids in them, except the tubers. It's natural plant. So it's plant self-defense, right? They're trying to prevent other things from eating them. Okay. Here's another question. It's, what do you do about white grubs? That eat on the White tubers, grubs. grubs. You know, yeah, that's a good question. Um, that's like a Jan Canova question. There, <laughs> well, usually that happens in a when when it's turf and they dig up yeah. the turf, and then the first year you got grubs in a yeah, yeah. And I've seen even even with like um, you get those like those black click beetles. We call them wireworms. Hmm. Um, sometimes even putting out the potatoes old potatoes by your crop, maybe you can use them as a trap, you know, before your potatoes start setting tubers. I've heard of people doing that, yeah, but I don't I, know yeah, the I best think. way to control that. How about hollow heart? How can we control that? Okay. So hollow heart is typically associated with um, kind of like you grow fast and you stop growth and you grow fast again. So the best thing to do is to try to maintain good, even growing conditions. So that's maintaining good soil moisture and, Good fertility is going to help you a lot with that. The other thing too is if your tubers are really big, the bigger tubers tend to have hollow hearts. So try to decrease your spacing. Try to plant them closer together. That might also help. Okay, Andy. Good. How about when this this gardener stores their potatoes? When should they remove the vines? For storing about two to three weeks before you want to harvest them, right. I would say. Yeah, you can, you can, sometimes you can even let the frost naturally kill your vines and that's not a problem as long as you don't have a hard frost that gets the soil frozen. So usually if you're above 25 degrees, it doesn't get into the soil very much, you know, unless you have a long period of time, but, but yeah, so what you're doing, basically you're trying to stop that plant from growing. And so those cells on the outside of the plant, they just kind of die and just kind of harden. And that's going to help set the tubers skin. So it doesn't rip or tear when you dig them out. Then it'll store better. Do you, yeah. do you have a recommendation for how? What's the best way to store potatoes? 
Yeah, the best thing to do is you really want to try to keep the temperature cooler and try to keep the humidity up. So the old cellars, you know, are perfect for potatoes. Um, you know, when we store them, we really, depending on what you're trying to do with it, right? If you have a red potato, you can probably store them at 38 to 40 degrees and try to keep the humidity up, you know, around 90% if possible. If it's a russet and you don't want it, and you want it to kind of be more starchy like it is, you probably only want to get it down to about 50 degrees. And again, try to maintain as much humidity as you possibly can. That'll help them store longer. And keep it dark, huh? Yep, and dark, certainly. Yeah, you don't want them getting green. I just I just take a, what I do at home, I just take a, a potato sack and just throw the top of a box, even if it, you know, it's in a room, because it keeps them dark, so. Okay, that's good. How, what, what, do you have a good variety for storage? What's your favorite? Um, it probably depends on, I guess, what color you want to grow. If it's a red variety, if you can find the variety Stangri, S-A-N-G-R-E, it tends to have better dormancy than a red Norland does. Um, if you're growing a Burbank potato, a russet Burbank is actually really good. It's very dormant. So those are a couple ones. Yellow ones are a little bit harder to find yellow varieties that are very dormant. They tend to not have a lot of dormancy to them. i got a question here. Are, do you have any tips about how to start eye growth in the spring for planting? How will have to start eye growth? Yeah. So to basically to break dormancy. Yeah. So the easiest thing to do is actually warm up your potatoes. So hmm. they're a living organism again. Right. And so with more heat, it's going to increase the metabolism and the, and the processes within that tuber. So you can just, just take them, you know, if you've got, I don't know where you're getting them at, but just bring them home and just put them in room temperature and just keep them dark and you can just like put them in a box or bag in the corner of a room and just keep an eye on them and you'll see those eyes start to peep pretty quick if if it's warm i guess the one thing to be cautious about too is sometimes seed can be treated or potatoes can be treated with a sprout inhibitor and that's why i don't recommend buying seed at a grocery store and trying to plant that because it often has a sprout inhibitor to keep those sprouts from growing and so sometimes if it's not growing that could be a possibility it might have could have been exposed Maybe unintentionally, but it could have been exposed to a sprout inhibitor. Okay. How about uh, what's the best potato for making lefsa? <laughs> That's a Julie Gardner question. I don't <laughs> yeah. know. Sorry. Yeah, I have no idea. I don't, I'm not a I'm not a cook, unfortunately. So, oh. um, do you have any comment between like having a sandy soil versus a heavy soil? What are some issues as far as yeah? You have to fertilize more in a sandy soil or do you plant deeper in one or the other? Or? Yeah. So sandy soils are nice for potatoes because they're going to really allow those tubers to really expand and grow well. Uh, but like you said, the disadvantage is your fertility is going to tend to kind of leach out the bottom easier. And so you're going to have to stay on top and water. You're going to have to maintain better watering practices. Whereas a, you know, a heavier soil that might have more clay or loam in it, they'll hold on to the nutrients better or hold on to the water better. Um, so yeah, I think you just, you got to manage them differently depending on what you're doing. Most of our red potatoes are typically grown in the heavier soils. And then most of the rest are grown in the sandier soils is what we see, you know, from large acreage. So. Yeah. How about, is there a general rule guide for plant spacing in the row? Like how far do you, should you plant the seeds apart from each other? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're growing a red potato like a red norlin you're probably going to be about nine inches apart in the row from seed to seed if it's a russet maybe 12 inches hmm. and then usually if you're doing multiple rows it's common to have them about three feet apart the rows because it's nice if your canopy can cover the whole row and shade it because that's going to actually keep the temperature lower on the tubers and it's going to help you maintain your moisture Okay, Andy, uh, your passion is potatoes. Does that include sweet potatoes? Do you have any general comments <laughs> no, about sweet potatoes? We don't really deal with many sweet potatoes here. They're difficult to grow, so sorry. Sweet potatoes, even though it says potatoes, they're, they're botanically way different than Irish potatoes. Yeah, okay. Um, it, is there really a difference in the taste between a home grown potato and a store bought potato? I don't know. <laughs> it's probably, it's probably, I, I, my guess would be it's probably variety. It's probably based on the variety. There are thousands of potato varieties out there. And so if you're buying a potato in a grocery store compared to a potato in your garden, 
it's probably really hard to say it's the exact same variety. Um, but as far as taste goes, it could be based on the soil you're growing it in, how it was grown. I don't know. But if you like the flavor of your garden potatoes, I say go for it, you know, grow those. Okay. How about, uh, do purple potatoes have higher antioxidants? I think they do, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. It probably okay. would again depend on the variety. So, you know, there's a lot of varietal differences. Yeah, it is true. And it's anthocyanins, which are a uh, component of antioxidants. How about uh, Andy? How about, uh, do, you, do you have a favorite variety of purple potato? What do you think about purple potatoes? How come um, we don't grow that many of them? Yeah, they're more of a specialty potato. They, I think they don't taste quite as good, you know, as some of the yellows and reds that are out there. And so they're more grown for restaurants for presentation is what I would think. And a lot of times, even when you grow them and try to mash them, they turn gray. So I guess if you want to have a gray mashed potato, it's kind of fun. But a lot of these colored potatoes, actually, when you boil them or cook them, they'll actually bleed out their colors. And so it's yeah, hard for them to maintain it's them. Disgusting. Yeah, we do variety trials on <laughs> it. And people say, like some some people will refuse to eat them. You say yeah. it, ru it ruined their, their uh, roast and they, there's, um, you know, just but uh, uh when when a potato plant blooms should you remove the flowers or does it make a difference i don't it doesn't make a difference really okay. i think they're fun to look at they're pretty okay uh how many hours of sun do, do potatoes need in the garden um well you most of the, i mean most of the potatoes we grow here are going to have a longer day than the night you know so they'll get thrown off there's some south american varieties i've seen grown actually in north dakota where our sunlight is too long and they won't set tubers but yeah there's not a um you'll be fine in the summer here because our days are plenty long i wouldn't be worried about that are you aware of any low glycemic varieties i don't know any off the top of my head sorry i think there's one from south dakota state it's um uh... Huckleberry gold. Does that sound right? Huckleberry gold. It's got gold and gold flesh inside and a purple. Actually, outside. I think I, yeah, I think that actually comes out of Idaho, that variety. Idaho. Yeah. Okay. What causes well, what causes brown streaks in potatoes? <laughs> a lot of things. <laughs> okay. That's a good answer. You know, if uh, yeah, if you have a specific question, send you know, either you can send me a picture or tell them a picture or you know, if it's something you see a lot, we can always send it to a diagnostic lab to get it tested. But yeah, it could be diseases. It could be all kinds of things, viruses. It could be injuries. So, yeah. How about, Andy, are you a fan of the ketchup and uh, French fry potato? That's a tomato plant that's grafted on top of a potato. I really haven't worked with those that much. So oh, it's hard really? to say. Well, I mean, you're probably competing, right? You're competing for energy to grow the potatoes and the tomatoes. So I don't know how that would compare to, you know, a p potato plant alone and tomato plant alone. Oh, you mean there's no commercial growers of that? No. No, no really. I that's harvest a, that's tomatoes much, and potatoes. Nah, that's, a, that's a gardening thing. So. It's a, it's garbage. That's what it is. It, it It's uh, you. Well, you're, you got two plants competing for the same nutrients, right? right? It's and better just, I mean. to, yeah, it's better to plant a tomato and plant a potato yeah and uh, you'll be better off you that's like negative uh synergism when they plant them together yeah. it's a gimmick we get a lot of gimmicks this time of year for gardeners um can you is, can do onions and potatoes store together sure yeah you can store them together potatoes might get a little onion flavor but yeah tastes good how about yep. uh do you have anything about beneficial plants with potatoes like, do they get along with a special other type of vegetable better? Or do they have plants they don't get along with? Not that I know of. Um, I know some guys that will interseed legumes in their potatoes to help mm. give them nitrogen. So you could put, you know, you could plant some beans or something maybe. But again, you're going to be competing for the same water and nutrients. But yeah. Yeah, maybe like uh, stay away from the same family, like tomatoes and potatoes. Oh, yeah. Just break yeah. up the family a little bit there. I would, yeah, yeah, because you're gonna have the same diseases attacking both of them. So there yeah. You go. And uh, another, there's sweet potato lovers out here. Can you grow them in North Dakota successfully? Uh, I'll say yes. I've, I've, I've talked to several. It's not easy. 
but you can do it. And the best idea is start your sweet potatoes right now and make your own slips. That's the key to success and generate as much heat as you can because like Andy says, a sweet potato is not, is not an Irish potato. They're very different. And uh, let's see what else. You talked about cutting potatoes for planting. Um, here, you ever, you, you, black scurf, any, anything about black scurf you want to mention? Well, black scurf's on the outside of the tuber, so you can just peel it off. If you don't like it, you can eat it too. It's not going to hurt you. The potatoes in the Red River Valley taste as good as the ones out here in the West. Probably not. I don't know. I don't know. But the one thing I do know is the color tends to stay the, the reds tend to have, they just have this, they maintain a much deeper red color through the Where, year. Where's so, that? In, in the Red River Valley. Do they? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. Yeah. If you're on kind of more of a sandier soil, they tend to, they tend to wash out the red color mm-hmm. tends to wash out more. I don't, we don't know exactly why that is, but we just see it all the time. So. There was a question about organic ways to control insects or pests. Mm-hmm. And I think that spinel said is that, well, that's organic. That's an organic product. That's the well, way to a, go. Uncle a Jack's organic. A vacuum's organic. There you go. Kids Chickens. are organic. Chickens organic. Ducks. You know, I mean, yeah, there's options, right? So lots of ways to go about that. Uh, <laughs> okay. Last question. Okay. Well, it's about sweet potatoes. Yeah, you can go sweet potatoes indoors under light, but I don't know. I mean, yeah. I know there's some commercial. I say I know there's some commercial sweet potatoes grown in Wisconsin, but that's about as far north as I've ever heard it, and I don't know how well they do. But that's it's tough. It's like you know, it's like trying to grow. You know, you're trying to grow a a plant that needs a lot of heat in in an environment really that doesn't have a lot of the heat and right conditions. So it's a challenge. But if you can do it successfully, hey, my hats off to you. That's great. That's right. Okay, so you know what I uh, when uh, can you use garden compost to top off? to put on top of potatoes? Um, I don't see why not. I think it would depend I mean, what's in that garden compost. You probably, again, you probably want to try to stay away from compost from maybe tomatoes, peppers, the same species, because you're probably going to have a little bit more disease incidence if you do that, because you're going to have the same you know, species. Okay, last question. Um, how about, you know, you talk about don't eat green potatoes. Well, how much green can we can you allow for before you get that tummy ache you talk about? Yeah, yeah, you know it's probably not going to kill you. And in, in the UK, uh, they've actually they've kind of gone trying to encourage people to eat a little bit of green potatoes so you're not wasting so much. But you know, I just kind of I, I tend to be more on the safe side and try to stay away from it. And the big thing to stay away from would be those sprouts. You know, if those potatoes start sprouting. Those sprouts actually have the highest concentration in them. Because you think about it, those sprouts are trying to grow. They're very young. They're very delicate. And so the potato plant is trying to protect itself against, you know, predators and eating it, right? So definitely cut sprouts off. But yeah, try to keep the green off just to be safe, I think. Because this is just the way to go, just to play it safe. Because potatoes are really inexpensive. It's just not worth it to get sick over. So That's right. Let the British eat it, Dad. That's ridiculous. You know, when in doubt, <laughs> toss it out. Okay, Andy, yeah. that was great. That was a great start to our year of spring fever garden forum talks and thank you so much yeah my pleasure thank you you.